Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Manitoba Agriculture Crop Talk webinar. If you have any questions during this presentation this morning, please type them into the Q&A icon on your Zoom toolbar at the bottom, and we will get to them at the end of the presentation. This webinar is being recorded, and you will receive a link to the recording. Thank you. Go ahead, Lionel. Thanks, Laurie. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to the uh, April 12th edition of, of Crop Talk, and uh, I guess welcome everybody to uh, our spring uh, spring crop talks. We'll be uh, starting today. We'll be doing a, a weekly one, uh, so every Wednesday we'll be going at uh, at nine o'clock and uh, run for about the hour. And we'll hopefully be keeping you up to date as to what's happening in the field and uh, different things that our specialists and agronomists are seeing out in the field and answering questions as as we go through the growing season. Uh, for today, I'm going to give just a little bit of an update on some things that have, are happening. I found a few uh, interesting things that I thought I'd bring up, and then uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about winter wheat, and then uh, from there, I'm um, going to give an update on our crop scouting panel, and um, from there, uh, a few remaining slides just to uh, finish up some of the information that's available out there for for you to uh, grab before we get into a busy growing season. Uh, I found this uh, on our, our website that I thought was uh, kind of interesting, uh, Agri-Manitoba weather extremes for uh, last year. And uh, there's a lot of uh, little tidbits on here that uh, I thought were interesting. Uh, the shortest frost-free period, uh, was in the Inglis open area, and that was from May 3rd to October 6th. So we had uh, 96 days of frost uh, free weather in that area. Uh, some of the uh, coldest temperatures, uh, Lake Audi seemed to be the, the place not to be for cold this year, uh, minus 46.2 on February the, uh, the 3rd. So that was uh, a pretty cold day and uh, at, at Lake Audi. Um, uh, greatest 24-hour precipitation was at Toulon uh, on July 19th. They got 114 millimeters. Uh, kind of remember that storm as as it went uh, went through. Um, Minnedosa, the greatest number of days with wind uh, greater than 50 kilometers an hour. They had 129 days. Uh, and uh, get talking to people, and people get are saying it seems like it's windier than normal. And I guess if you lived in Minnedosa the past year, I guess you're probably one of the people that are that are saying that. Um, um, lowest annual precipitation, Pearson, kind of the unlucky area for that uh, this past year. Um, Wascada, 24 days, greater days, uh, days of over 30 degrees Celsius. So probably one of the warmer areas uh, uh, in the past year. Uh, longest stretch without measurable rain, uh, 36 days in Finley. Uh, so that would be kind of just in that uh, uh, north of Hartney, uh, or south of Hartney, north of Deloraine area. Greatest wind gusts in a, in a day, uh, 126 kilometers an hour on July 19th in Clearwater. So that was a, a breezy there, day there. You probably wouldn't want it to be on Pelican Lake that day. Uh, Altona, greatest potential evaporation, 13 millimeters uh, in June the 19th. Uh, longest frost free period was Austin this year, uh, from May 3rd to October the 6th. Um, highest air temperature for the for the year, Portage de Prairie on June 19th was 38.6 degrees Celsius. Uh, Rosa, greatest annual precipitation, 792 millimeters, and we remember all those storms that went through southeastern Manitoba this past year that uh, brought a lot of a uh, lot of rain their way. And uh, just a couple more there. Greatest monthly precipitation was Marchand at uh, 211 millimeters, and the greatest one-hour precipitation they had 62 millimeters in in. Uh, and from 1 to 2 p.m. on July the 19th. So that was uh, that was a lot of rain in a short period of time. And the greatest annual air temperature change uh, went from minus 43 degrees Celsius on February 3rd to 36.3 degrees Celsius on June 19th at, uh, at Prada. That's a pretty big change in temperature from uh, over those, those few months there. So uh, found this pretty interesting. I'm glad that uh, 
Timmy and, uh, and Allison can kind of put this kind of information together. It kind of gives us a, a recap of last year and uh, as to uh, what we what we did go through. And uh, hopefully uh, we don't see some of those extremes this year, but it should be nice to get the, the frost free days and, and the average rainfall. So from there, I'm going to just uh, talk a little bit about uh, the winter wheat crop. I think it's time where we uh, are, aren't too long from being able to go out and assess uh, how the winter wheat and the fall rye crop is done through the winter. And uh, when you uh, you look at soil temperatures, uh, the Manitoba Ag Weather Stations uh, uh, had some uh, winter uh, probes in the ground, uh, uh, checking soil uh, temperatures. And uh, I guess one of the biggest things for uh, winter wheat is the temperature at crown depth, and that's critical for winter wheat survival. A lot of research has shown that, uh, uh, you know, the cold hardiness changes through the winter and spring. And the biggest thing is the crown temperatures need to be, you know, minus 20 or above during the winter months to be successful for overwintering. A lot of times snow will definitely help. And uh, I think in most areas this year, we did have the snow. So I don't think we're gonna be uh, too, should be too concerned about not having enough snowfall to keep it good throughout the, the winter season. And when you look at Melita, for example, and this is just from December to the uh, beginning of January, a lot of the, uh, the soil temperature never dropped much below, uh, you know, minus 3.5 to minus 4.5 uh, was probably so again, you know, uh, staying, staying well within that uh, 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 good zone for, for the crowns to survive. Just uh, to further go on about some of the research that's been done as to, uh, uh, you know, where you need to be uh, and throughout the the, the growing season. And when you look at September, October, that's usually still when we do get some, some good growth in, in our winter wheat crops. And a lot of times, you know, as long as the temperature doesn't go, you know, below minus four, uh, those, those growing, uh, the, the plants will continue to grow. Um, from uh, November through to, uh, through to, you know, probably the end of February, beginning of March is, is where you need that, uh, prolonged cover of snow cover and, you know, trying to keep the, the, the crown in that, you know, minus 20 and under is where you want to be. And if it, any time it stops, starts dropping below the minus 20, you do, uh, uh, you know, you run into the risk of, uh, of, of uh, getting some damage to the crowns. I think right now what uh, we uh, are probably, or we are in the period of that, you know, uh, April, May, and uh, we are seeing some of this right now where we're seeing uh, um, some pretty big warm up happening right now. And so we're getting a lot of the snow melting off and uh, we've been lucky so far. Our evenings haven't got too cold. You know, we're getting, you know, that minus, you know, minus four to minus five range. So I think we're, we're doing okay there. I think the biggest worry we, we could have is if we start getting some night temperatures returning to minus 10 to minus 15, and we could see some spring damage to those crowns. So um, I guess it'll depend a little bit on the next little while here. Uh, long range forecast from what I've been seeing, uh, they are, you know, for this weekend, they're calling for some rain, maybe some snow and uh, temperatures in the evenings going down to that minus eight, minus 10. So, uh, you know, we could, see some damage, maybe some damage to some of the weaker crowns. And um, the, the freezing and thawing is the, is, the, is the critical thing right now. And if you get uh, too much of that, that's where you can start seeing some damage. Biggest thing is we, um, once the winter wheat breaks dormancy, and if you get days like today and yesterday where we're, you know, 14 and 15 degrees Celsius and the winter wheat breaks its dormancy and starts to grow, then uh, and then we get the, the freezing. That's where you could get uh, get get or start seeing some damage. Um, again, this is just showing uh, um, some uh, soil temperatures over the past while. Uh, you know, from uh, March the twentieth to uh, April the tenth, and seeing what soil temperatures have been doing in in the southwest of Manitoba and kind of central Manitoba, and you can see. 
a lot of the soil temperatures are sitting in that anywhere from that minus, uh, I guess, anywhere in lows of minus six in some of the areas of the southwest to, uh, you know, getting really close to zero in the odd, odd station and reporting a little above, but uh, a lot of them are still uh, reporting zero to minus four range. So, uh, you know, we'll, we're just going to be in a situation if we get days like uh, more days like today's shaping up to be where you are, uh, you might start seeing that winter wheat start breaking some of that dormancy and starting to starting to throw out some uh, new shoots out of the out of the crown. So what to look for uh, when you go out there in the winter wheat is you want to see, and I put the, the arrows here, the red arrows showing uh, uh, new growth coming out of, of the crown and you can see new roots developing. And that's, uh, that's a key right there uh, showing you that your, uh, your, uh, your winter wheat crop has, uh, has made, it, uh, made it through the winter and, and is going to start, uh, start going. Uh, what I've usually found is fall rye tends to be a little bit more aggressive and a lot more seems to be a lot more winter hardy and don't seem to be running into as many issues and you can see uh, these pictures definitely weren't taken this year they were taken uh, I think a couple of years ago but uh, and and a little bit uh, later in the growing season not uh, not an April 12th picture more like a you know end of April sort of picture so <clears throat> I I guess now is the time where you know you can start looking around and nosing around just to see what's happening. But you probably aren't going to see a lot of uh, a lot of those uh, new roots growing yet. Just a few notes: uh, if, when we do get the winter wheat growing, uh, you know, 20 plants per square foot is kind of where we uh, where we want to be. Uh, but uh, you know, we have seen a lot of good uh, stands come from 10 to 15 plants per square foot. Uh, winter wheat has the ability to produce a lot of tillers, and uh, it can compensate uh, for uh, for uh, uh, you know maybe not having the optimal plant count. One of the biggest things I usually run into when uh, we're out there uh, trying to assess a stand is uh, the unevenness in a field, and that's where you know you'll run into areas where you'll have you know twenty plus plants per square foot of row, but then when you get into some areas, you might uh, might be down into that eight to nine plants, maybe even less. Uh, but uh, the, the trick in, in all of that is determining where your bet, where your biggest areas are and where you are more, if the, the, the biggest areas are the most uh, damaged areas, then you might have to start looking at something. But uh, you know, if you're there, the small areas in the field, uh, again, winter wheat can definitely compensate and, uh, and can still produce a, a good crop and uh, no need to uh, panic, I guess, is the big thing. And uh, one of the, the things that I always like to say is uh, you don't need to make a decision on your winter wheat crop until probably you're halfway done seeding your cereals and in the spring. And then this way, you'll have given it the best chance to see what it's going to turn out to be. There is a couple methods of uh, seeing uh, that uh, I've used in the past as seeing if, uh, if your uh, plants have survived the winter. And uh, one of them would be uh, the, the bag test or the plastic bag test. And what you do is you get a Ziploc bag. You go out there and you dig up uh, a bunch of uh, a, a clump of plants, uh, rinse off the, the seedlings, and then clip off any of the below the crown, uh, this, uh, clip off the, uh, the roots below the crown, and then uh, with the stems about one inch above the crown. And then you place the, the crown in a plastic bag with, uh, with the air still in the bag and, and seal the bag and keep it at room temperature. Uh, you uh, repeat uh, this uh, rinsing and adding air every couple days. And probably about after about six days, you uh, will see, you should see some new growth. Uh, if you don't see new growth at that time period, um, I guess there's two things to think about. Uh, one thing is uh, that uh, that plant, uh, you know, may, maybe uh, those plants aren't going to make it. The other thing is that, uh, and this is usually what pops into my mind first, is did I do it right? And so in my case, I usually go out and, and grab another sample and uh, and do it again, uh, you know, uh, uh, six days in, in at this time of year, uh, uh, deciding on a crop is in a long period of time. And I think it would uh, be to your advantage to, uh, to, to try the test again. If you're not comfortable doing that test, 
Another way is uh, I take a spade out with me and a, and a, a pail and our ice cream pail usually works pretty good. Dig up some plants, leaving the soil uh, ball intact and then bringing it inside to a warm and a sun, sunny area. And then after a week to 10 days, you know, clean the soil off and wash the roots off and, and you'll be able to see uh, that, look for that healthy uh, white uh, roots coming out of the crown. And, uh, you know, that's gonna tell you right there if the, if the, if the winter wheat uh, plant has made it. One thing, the other, I guess the other thing with doing these tests at this time of year, uh, if you do go out too early, uh, the ground is still fairly frozen right now in a lot of places. So uh, you're not going to, uh, uh, it's not going to be easy to dig out a sample. So make sure you're, you're getting a, a, a good sample through, out of the ground and not wrecking the plant as you're bringing it up because you can do damage that way. And that's going to affect uh, what kind of results you get uh, in those six or 10 days after. And, uh, but uh, both ways, uh, fairly easy to do. And uh, if anything, it gets you in the field too and gets you seeing what's going on. Uh, with uh, with the plants and and what's happening with some of the weeds that are out there growing and seeing if there's some winter annuals that you might need to be dealing with uh, later on uh, before you get too busy uh, uh, seeding uh, all your other crops uh, and just gives you a, a note as to making sure you go back to the your your winter crops and 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 checking on them. I guess uh, when it does come down to it and you need to make a decision whether uh, whether or not uh, that crop uh, can or can't be saved anymore. Uh, there's, there are some factors to consider. Um, a lot of times winter wheat is either planted into pea stubble or canola stubble. So a lot of producers, if they have to terminate a winter wheat crop, are looking at what else they can grow and, you know, are not really interested in growing canola on canola or, or you know, putting peas on peas or trying to keep up a rotation. Um, one of the problems we do see with uh, with winter wheat, uh, sometimes if you do plant uh, hard red wheat into it, is uh, uh, a disease called wheat streak mosaic, and uh, it's caused by leaf hoppers, and uh, they'll have a virus on them that they'll transfer from uh, the winter wheat plants that do survive. Because when you do go to terminate that crop, uh, you're going to have a lot of green material out there because you know, you maybe got a 50, 50 or 60% crop out there. So there's still a lot of green material and, and the leaf hoppers will be uh, on it. And, and they'll, uh, when you plant your new crop into it, the, the key is to uh, uh, destroy the old crop or the old winter wheat crop. And they call it a green bridge. And if the leaf hopper can go from the winter wheat to uh, the spring crop or cereal crop that you plant in, uh, in the, uh, in that field, uh, they'll transfer it uh, to the crop and you can get this striping on, on the leaves as you see uh, on, on the, in the picture there. And a lot of times uh, that'll, uh, that'll cause uh, just plants to uh, not mature. They uh, tend to be stunted in growth. Uh, a lot of pale coloring in the field caused by, as you can see, the striping is kind of a limish kind of the green color and just reduction in yield. So uh, um, usually they say you need, you know, six to seven days where, where there's no green material out there for uh, the leaf hopper to be on. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's one thing to watch for if you do land up being in a situation when you need, where you may need to terminate a winter wheat crop. The other thing is, uh, maybe do look at uh, going to a crop like a, an oil seed or a flax or something like that. Uh, some, uh, flax is an oil seed, but going to something different besides uh, another cereal on it because it'll, uh, it'll be uh, um, just something that uh, you may want to, uh, uh, to watch for. Uh, we do have Dave Kaminsky on the line right now. And uh, Dave is uh, uh, our, uh, Crop pathologist and uh, Dave, if you uh, have a comment on that. Uh, yes, Lionel, since you mentioned uh, wheat streak mosaic, which is a disease, I've got to hop on because the vector in this case is not a leaf hopper, it's a wheat curl mite, which is a tiny, tiny critter and it's very inconspicuous. Uh, you won't see it unless you're uh, unrolling leaves generally, they're um, inside a curled edge of a leaf. Um, but that's something that you probably will only really be able to visualize under uh, a dissecting scope. 
or with a, a good hand lens. So sorry to correct you, Lionel, but uh, you see John G isn't on the line. I thought I better hop on. No, that's great. Uh, thanks for uh, picking up on that. That was uh, that's definitely a mistake on my part, and uh, that's why I'm glad uh, glad to have you guys on uh, to do that for me. So super. Thanks a lot for that, Dave. Okay, so um, I think that's all I had to mention about winter wheat and fall rye. Uh, again, uh, it's something that uh, uh, I think we'll be able to start assessing within the next uh, week to 10 days. So definitely uh, uh, be ready to go out there and to uh, start doing that. One of the other things that uh, we're going to probably be doing in the next uh, little while here is determining soil temperature as we're getting into seeding. We want to definitely be looking at seeding uh, into soil that's, uh, I guess, good for uh, early germination and getting that, uh, that seed out of the ground fast. And I think that's one of the, the things we've been facing in the last few years is maybe not uh, uh, seeding into uh, good soil conditions and because of that running into other problems and uh, you know I'll use uh, canola as an advantage uh, with uh, with our whole flea beetle situation I think you want uh, the seed in the ground the canola germinating and out of the ground and uh, as quick as possible so uh, I think uh, soil temperature is something we need to be uh, keeping an eye on one of the things I'd like to do is uh, uh, to get a good average is to uh, take a reading at uh, seeding depth in the morning and then in the early evening and uh, then average the two readings and that'll give you a, a, a better uh, a reading of what the, the soil temperature actually is as compared to going out and you know in the afternoon if you're driving across the field and just want to jump out of the truck and, and see what soil temperature is it'll give you a reading for that time of day but uh Got to remember, uh, evenings are still getting fairly cool. Uh, a lot of the soil is fairly moist still, and uh, it uh, as it cools, that wetness even gets the soil to cool a little bit more. And so, uh, it's good to do a reading uh, in the morning and and uh, uh, you know mid morning and mid you know mid uh, mid to late afternoon and uh, and average the two readings out. Uh, I usually like to uh, do it at where you're going to be seeding depth too. Uh, some people like to do it actually in the two different uh, ranges, seeding depth and, you know, about three to four inches down. And uh, just to kind of get uh, an average of what the, the, the temperature is a little bit deeper, which probably isn't a bad idea. And uh, again, determine going out there and getting uh, doing uh, the soil temperatures at this time is uh, is a good idea because uh, it also, like I said, gets you out there checking and seeing what's going on in some of those fields, uh, give you a good uh, opportunity to maybe uh, assess uh, some of your uh, last fall uh, weed control and seeing if you've got uh, some winter annuals that are growing and things you might need to do to get that field in good condition for, uh, for uh, this spring's planting. This is uh, something that uh, I found uh, a long time ago and I dug it up for one of my presentations and it was minimum germination temperatures for various crops. So uh, when you look down, you know, we're wheat and barley are anywhere between three and five degrees Celsius. So, you know, it makes sense why a lot of producers are usually putting, uh, you know, those are some of our earlier crops to go in the ground as well as peas. If you look down at, at peas, you're looking at four degrees Celsius. So. Um, you know, we're going to be, uh, uh, you know, a week to 10 days off those type of temperatures, I guess, depending on what the weather brings. But, uh, you know, I think uh, it's going to be a bit before we get into those uh, those temperatures yet. But uh, again, uh, good starting points for before you go out there and start putting a lot of seed in the ground. You look at oats around you know, five degrees, and then you get into some of the ones that are uh, probably, uh, I guess, Ones that I think that need to be more, you need to take more attention on. You could, uh, you know, with wheat and barley, you know, three degrees to five degrees, you know, you probably could get out there as soon as you, as you're able to travel on the field and you're probably not too far off that temperature. But 
when you're starting to deal with uh, crops that seed is very expensive, like uh, canola, soybeans, uh, not saying that any of the other seed is cheap, but some of this is a lot more expensive. You know, you're looking at 10 degrees Celsius for some of those, uh, you know, corn 10 degrees Celsius. So uh, again, if the temperature isn't in that range by putting those, uh, especially canola in the ground, you, know, you, you let it sit in the ground and once you plant the seed, uh, your clock starts ticking on your seed treatment. And uh, I think we ran into some of that problems uh, with, uh, in the last couple of years, uh, soil temperatures uh, weren't as warm and we were putting uh, canola in the ground. And uh, then all of a sudden it sat there for a week to 10 days. And then once it starts coming up, it, uh, uh, and last year is a good example where it started coming up and our, uh, our, uh, our soil temperatures and air temperatures weren't warming up real fast. So it kind of just sat there and basically the flea beetles came in once it warmed up and there was nothing there to help, uh, help out those canola plants. So I think uh, in, when you're planting canola this year, that's definitely one of the things you should be looking at. Some guys have been pushing the soybean thing a little bit and been starting to plant them a little bit earlier every year now. Now, again, yeah, you're okay as long as uh, it doesn't sit in the ground too long. And uh, and hopefully if it does come up early that we don't get any cool evenings because that's another thing to watch for. Um, you know, I've had guys, uh, you know, normally that soybeans, you know, anywhere between the, the 10th and 15th of May used to be a, kind of a, a guideline for, but uh, in the last, uh, Few years guys have been putting them in early and earlier so uh, just because seeding is they ran out of crop to put in so they went to them so uh, definitely uh, keep an eye on these soil temperatures it's uh, gonna help the crop get off to a good start and that's what you're aiming for when you, uh, when you get out there on the field talked to a couple of producers the past weekend it was kind of funny because it uh, guys seemed to think that we were falling behind and you know it was getting late and you know it's, we got way too much snow and it's just amazing what a, a few days will do um, with some warm weather and uh, and now guys are saying they're not going to be ready to get out there and I just thought I'd put this one out this is information that comes from uh, MASC and uh, you know, uh, planting days and, and relative yields to 100%. And when you look at uh, uh, where we are right now, uh, you know, we're still, you know, probably good two weeks away from the, the 1st of May. So we're definitely not in any area where any of these curves will start to come down yet. So, uh, you know, we definitely have time. Uh, as long as we're in the field, you know, that Last week in April, first week of May, uh, I think we're going to be just just where we want to be. Uh, yield Manitoba. This is something that uh, I had put together uh, a couple of uh, uh, presentations ago, but uh, we just didn't seem to have enough time to go through it. And this Yield Manitoba comes out from MASC and is a really good book on on different varieties and and how they do uh, in throughout Manitoba here and. Uh, uh, it's definitely a book that's uh, worth a good read, not only because of the good information, but there's a whole bunch of good articles in there as well. So uh, I, I think it's something that everybody should have a copy of. And if you don't have a copy of it at home right now, I'm sure the MASC offices or service centers uh, have them and uh, just stop by and ask if you can get a copy. But just a few things that I pulled out of them. Uh, I'm going to look at the top four crops and just give a few bullet points on each one here. But when you look at red spring wheat, uh, the average yield last year uh, was uh, 61 bushels an acre, uh, which is a lot higher than, than our, our 21 yield, and um, but only 7% better than our 10 year average. But you know, again, showing that some of the varieties coming out are definitely have some good yield potential. Uh, something that was different this year was uh, usually a lot of our highest yields are are happening in, in the southern part of the province, but this year it was the northwest and and even as far north as uh, you know Swan Valley and and, and as far, far as as the Paw actually as to where we were getting some really good and high yields this year. So uh, uh, all depends on weather patterns and when rain happened, but. Uh, uh, again, AC Brandon uh, or AAC Brandon was the most planted, and 
uh, acres, and it accounted for 45 percent of uh, of the uh, of the total Red Spring acres. So uh, a variety that has uh, been uh, been proven, I guess, across the province that it's going to it has been and is going to be a good yielder. Um, Starbuck, I guess, was one of the best yielding ones. And again, this was in the Swan Valley area where it reached some areas uh, as high as 83 bushels an acre. So some pretty outstanding yields in, in some of those areas just north of, uh, north of the park. Canola um, acres was basically unchanged from last year. Um, Average yield across the province was about 41 bushels an acre, uh, which is 10 years higher than uh, 21, and but only one year higher than our average. So, uh, you know, definitely did hear about uh, some uh, some crops yielding a lot better, but when you look at it as a province-wide, you're about 41 bushels an acre. And again, some of our better yielding areas, uh, again, they got it as Roblin Shellmouth with an average of 51 bushels on almost 70,000 acres and the Swan River area. 47 bushels on uh, 116,000 acres. So again, some pretty some pretty good yields uh, north of the park this year. And uh, uh, we did have some decent yields in in the south, uh, but uh, again, you know, uh, I think uh, on average, again, I think uh, it uh, was uh, uh, just an average year. 40 41 bushel average is kind of just what we were all hoping for when we plant our crops. So it's uh, I think. Uh, uh, yielded good, but uh, you know, definitely did hear of uh, of some yields that were higher than that. That's for sure. Soybeans, uh, even though the acres were down last year, uh, this still was our third largest acreage of uh, crop uh, planted last year, which kind of surprised me when I uh, I uh, was going through the information. I did think that it was our, our acres were definitely down last year, and. Uh, but, uh, you know, I guess even though they were down, uh, I think uh, because of that, uh, we did get some, uh, some pretty good yields, I guess. Uh, we uh, averaging uh, yield was about 45 uh, bushels an acre, which was up by 18 bushels from, from 21 and three bushels higher than uh, our previous record of, of 42 in 2016. That could probably explain why there's been a bit of a renewed interest in soybeans again this year from talking to producers. I definitely see that there's going to be a few more acres planted this year, which is which is probably a good thing because it is a good rotation crop. And it uh, also uh, gives us a little bit of break from some of the, maybe the higher price uh, fertilizer uh, that's out there that, uh, you know, maybe we can... Uh, uh, you know, save a little bit of money on there, especially if you can get in that, you know, that 40 bushel an acre uh, yields on it. Uh, I think uh, it's a crop that a lot of producers are looking at again. And our last one of the top four was oats, and it was the fourth most planted uh, crop last year. The average yield was 120 bushels an acre and uh, eight short of a record of 2017. Summit uh, probably the most uh, was the most popular variety. It was grown on 217,000 acres, and it averaged 126 bushels an acre. Uh, there's a new variety, just a uh, numbered variety that was sown on a few acres that did uh, get up to that 160 bushels in the Roland area, and uh, there was another uh, uh, the Louise municipality did average about 145 bushels an acre. So uh, we're definitely uh, getting to be a province that can grow a lot of oats if, if we put our minds to it. And I think uh, that may have reflected it a bit uh, right now in the market because the price has definitely dropped and they're talking about uh, large carryouts into this coming year. So um, I think uh, it's, a, it's a crop that uh, definitely we, we can grow. Uh, I think we can grow it and really manage our nutrients with it. Um, and uh, and maybe save a uh, save a little, few dollars on on some of our inputs, and um, and I think just a crop that I think uh, we've been able to to develop pretty good in Manitoba here. So a crop that I can think will continue to be growing. Uh, and I think acres are going to be down on it this year, but it'll be interesting to see if uh, if it drops back to fifth from uh, twenty two or if it. Uh, if it uh, manages to keep in the top four. But uh, right now, I would say the odds are probably against it uh, from talking to producers. I think the acres are, are down, uh, are probably gonna be down this year. Another book that uh, 
I think it's something that you should have uh, in your office or in your tractor or your truck as the variety selection and, and uh, grower source guide. I think it's a, an excellent book. It's got a lot of real good information regarding uh, not just yield, but uh, how uh, certain varieties respond to disease. And uh, we're getting, uh, uh, I think we're getting more and more information on varieties and how they might uh, suit different areas better. And you can see that when you look through that Yield Manitoba book, there's some varieties that just do awesome in some areas compared to other areas. And uh, I think that's uh, with a combination of these two books, you could probably put together a pretty good seed plan for your farm where you can pick varieties that are, have potential for good yields and then see how they've been uh, yielding in, in other areas through the Yield Manitoba book. So uh, um, this book, I think, is only going to get better because I think uh, as we more incorporate more of the disease uh, research that's being done as to how different varieties respond to, you know, uh, black leg or verticillium stripe or uh, rust and oats, uh, or even uh, the use of, uh, of uh, manipulator for uh, uh, reduction in, in uh, you know, your stand height. Uh, I think, uh, you know, knowing more about these varieties is important. And I think uh, this is a good opportunity for uh, for you to be able to go through that and compare it to your farm, your area, and develop a good seeding plan. So another book I think that uh, is good to have around. The big book is out. The Guide to Field Crop Production 2023 is out. It's available at your ag service centers right now. If you require um, uh, a larger quantity books or you're uh, wanting to find out where to get them, uh, like I mentioned, the Ag Services Center or contact your local ag extension specialist, uh, we can get you, uh, you know, one to, to 10 to 15 copies if you need it. Uh, they're available, they're 10 bucks still. Uh, so again, uh, a good buy, the book is only getting bigger. So uh, it's, uh, uh, again, another, another tool that you need as we get into the growing season. Uh, there's a lot of uh, new, uh, new products coming out that are helping to, uh, I shouldn't say a lot of new products, but there's a lot of new uh, strategies for fighting some of our resistant problems out there, whether it be kosher, whether it be uh, water hemp, whether it be um, uh, any of the, the weeds that are starting to cause more and more uh, kosha, uh, whether that are starting to cause more problems. I think uh, if you have the guide, you can look through and you can see where maybe a, a pre-emergent product might be something that, that you could use to help uh, to control some of these problems or a combination of a pre-emergent and post-emergent. Again, you know, again, that information is in these books and, uh, you know, between that and your uh, local Local dealer uh, or local agronomist, uh, you could definitely put a, a plan together to uh, to get control of these. But now is the time to start looking at at the book because it's uh, it's got that information, and you know we're not that far away from you know starting to look at at weed control. And I mentioned this a couple times, and I just uh, uh, as you're out in the fields right now, now is the time to start looking at, uh, at at what kind of weeds you have out there growing. You'll be definitely seeing your winter annuals uh, starting up in the next little while here, and uh, you'll need to know and start making a plan for, for controlling them. Okay, so after that, I'm going to talk a little bit now about uh, our crop scouting panel. Uh, we're going to have a few changes this year. I would like to say a big thank you to uh, John Hurd and Dane Fraze uh, as they're both leaving Manitoba Ag. Uh, I think one to retire and one to uh, go on to bigger and better things. Hopefully, uh, I think John is retiring after several years and uh, he's going to be definitely missed uh, within our group and probably with a lot of producers uh, and industry people that he's helped, <coughs> excuse me, over the last few years or last several years. And Dane Fraze, I think, is uh, going back to the family farm and is going to be uh, farming and, and starting his family. And so, uh, again, I'd like to thank uh, all these guys, uh, or these two guys, for helping us out over the last while here. And uh, I'm sure they're going to be around if we need to get a hold of them. Um, you know, they're, uh, they're not going to be uh, leaving us totally in, out of the loop. So if we still have questions, maybe we'll be able to get there. Uh, new phone numbers and, and talk to them that way. But uh, I'd like to thank them for being on the panel. 
Uh, the environmental farm plan. Uh, it's online and has been, uh, we've been talking about it most of the winter. And I think it's still something that uh, as producers, we need to keep on top of. So if you uh, need to update your environmental farm plan or haven't done one yet, a lot of the new programs that are coming out uh, require us to have this done. So it can be done online. It's uh, actually a fairly easy process to do. Uh, if you've got questions, uh, you know, uh, get in contact with uh, your uh, uh, ag extension people or, uh, you know, uh, uh, anybody through Manitoba Agriculture and we can help you find the right place to go or even help you go right through the whole process and make sure you, you don't have any problems. Our crop production specialists uh, uh, they haven't had it Caleb and Veronica so we've got uh, uh, six of us uh, uh, throughout the, the province right now and uh, so that's if you have any questions uh, you know feel free to contact any of us uh, and uh, we're we're around and able to give you a hand if if you need our livestock people and I'd like to apologize for not having uh, the full the full uh, core of them on here in the past. I uh, miss Cindy and Kristen, so uh, I got their information on there now and and their contact and for phone numbers there. So uh, again, a, a good group of uh, producers and a, a good group of livestock people that can help you uh, uh, whether you're looking at uh, uh, doing rations to looking at seeding pasture to something with your livestock herd health programs. You know, definitely get a hold of any any of these people. Our service centers, uh, that's where they're located. That's their toll-free numbers. So definitely feel free to contact them. I mentioned if you're looking for the weed guides, uh, they're there and available. Uh, so uh, definitely stop by and, uh, and grab copies of them there. Our hay listing service, uh, we may be uh, Getting close to the period where we may not see a lot of hay being moved uh, right now, but uh, there's still some guys looking and there's still some guys selling. So uh, if you got hay for sale, definitely uh, um, get your information in. Uh, and if you uh, are having problems with that, uh, if you give Lori a, a call uh, or send her a, an email, I got her information at the end here. Uh, she could definitely uh, you know, give you a hand. Uh, uh, her and Aaron actually are probably on the 1-800 line as well, so definitely contact them there. And there's our information, mine, Lori's, uh, and there's the 1-800 number. So if you got any questions, please, please feel free to give us a call. Um, and uh, I guess that can, can completes uh, the crop talk for this week. And join us next week, April 19th. Uh, I'm guessing on that date, we'll be about a week away from being in the field. So uh, uh, hope to see everybody again next week. And thanks for attending.